welcome to the workshop. I thought today I might squeeze in a bit of work on the amazing Outspan Orange. Now, back in the early 70s, when you could actually choose the supplier of the fruit that you bought in the supermarket or the grocers, a company called Outspan, now Cape Span, a South African fruit company, actually commissioned a guy called Brian Thwaite to build, well, half a dozen of these promotional vehicles. Now, throughout the 70s and 80s, at fairs and outdoor events all over the country, you'd find one of these outspan oranges doing its thing, sampling, giving out free oranges. And that's where I first saw one, and I was instantly smitten. And it obviously left its mark, because, of course, years later, I started building all kinds of my own wacky vehicles. And it was a great honour to finally race against one in my sofa at Donington Race Circuit. Now, over the years, fruit marketing changed, and unfortunately these guys fell out of use, but you can still go and see them at museums such as the National Motor Museum at Bewley, and also the Grampian Transport Museum up in Scotland. But the rest of them ended up in private hands, and I got hold of mine from Cape Span themselves, but unfortunately it was in a really sorry state of repair. Basically, they'd been using it to supply bits to keep the other two on the road, and when I first got this, it had no windscreen at all. Now, of course, back in the day, it was an acrylic windscreen, which was no longer legal, so my my first problem to solve was to actually get a glass windscreen made. So I went to the chaps over at Pilkington and they had a bit of a trouble trying to make one. And the reason it's so difficult, if you imagine that you've got a piece of glass, it's just like a bit of paper. You can bend it in one direction or you can bend it in the other direction, but you can't bend it into a compound curve. And of course, being an orange, being spherical, this is a compound curve. So they had a real battle trying to get the glass to actually bend into the right shape. And now they've finally got the moulds or the pattern correct. If I were to break another one, get a stone chip, at least I know I can now get a new piece of glass. So having got my brand new windscreen, I was desperate to go on a drive. And so what I did is I went on the London to Brighton Mini Run because this Outspan Orange is based on a Mini. It was fantastic fun, really, really wonderful. And I've done lots of other events since, things like Carfest and other various shows. But the most recent thing I did was a piece for Deutsche Welle, which is rather like the German BBC. And we were driving around for the day, but unfortunately the car didn't really behave itself. First of all, I had to jump start it because the battery was flat, it had been standing for so long. And then throughout the day, it kept cutting out and sort of running a little bit strangely. And eventually it just cut out altogether. And that was the end of the day's play. So today I thought I'd see what the problem is and see if I can fix it. So to that end, I've already fitted a brand new battery. That way it's definitely going to turn over. So I'll just turn on the kill switch, turn on the ignition and go for start. Oh, I mustn't forget the choke. It's got a manual choke on this. It's turning over nicely. Well, it's spilling over nicely, but nothing's really going on. But I can already smell a bit of that fuel. Now, the really lovely thing about the orange is that obviously the engine sits underneath here and this is my bonnet. So I just pop that open like so. <laughs> so I've seen our first issue and that is that there is a bird's nest in the engine or at least on the engine. I best remove that, I think. Now, one could perhaps suggest that I need to increase my maintenance schedule and maybe I shouldn't have left this out in the yard for quite so long, but at least somebody else has got to use the vehicle for their own uses. Now, I can't get that nest out without removing the air filter, but thankfully it's only held on with two of these sort of wing nuts, extended wing nuts, really. Okay, just pop that out of the way. Right. Ooh. Looks like it was vacated some time ago. Oh. <laughs> that is brilliant. <laughs> Now, having removed the air filter, straight away I can see that I've got this wet looking fuel line. So if I'm just going to turn it over again. <laughs> OK, so got loads of fuel coming out of this very perished fuel line. I could see the moisture from the top, but actually the split it seems to be at the very, very bottom. It's just pouring fuel all over the engine, which would explain that smell and of course over time it must have obviously started going a couple of years back and as I haven't actually attended to it clearly it's just got much much worse so obviously that is going to be the next thing to fix and I think while I'm at it I might also replace the fuel filter for a new one just because I guess it wouldn't hurt would it oh. wow okay <laughs> so it's completely perished 
you've got, you've got an in that end and an out at that end. Okay, so then I just want to make sure that it's about the same sort of length, give or take. So I'm going to go for around about there. Cut that. And I can put that onto the engine bay. Right, so now that is in place. Although I've got loads of other things I want to do before I really start the engine, I should just check to make sure that we're okay. So hopefully that will fill up with fuel and no fuel will go over the engine. <laughs> well, that's a pleasant surprise. So actually it runs really rather nicely as soon as I sorted out that fuel problem. And of course the reason is when the fuel's leaking out, that also means air can get in, which means of course it wasn't necessarily getting any fuel into the carburetor. But with that sorted, I might still do a few more checks just to make sure we've gone on a bit of a run. So the first of those being, I might as well change the air filter for a fresh new one because it has been a while. Well, actually, you know, it's a little bit dirty. You can see a bit of dust coming out. It's not too bad, but I definitely will change it. So you've got that marked difference there, lovely. Just pop that in there like so, and then make sure I get this lined up. The little arrow there, it just sits on the side of a square there. Cool. And put that in. Not a lot of room in here, but just about enough. Just sit on there like so. So now the air filter's done. The next thing to check is the spark plugs. Got no idea when they were last changed or even checked. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just mark each of the leads so I don't get them confused. of straw, was that a warm straw colour, nice brown, light brown, and that's looking like a good little burn. I have to check the gap, but that's all right. Oh well, it's not looking so good. I mean, it's looking very sooty from this side, quite oily. This side, you can see there's a little tiny bit of okay-ish burn colour there, but you have to see through the soot. So that might mean that perhaps, you know, the rings, the oil control rings are starting to go on that particular cylinder, but we'll see what happens, see what the rest are like. Oh dear, not so easy to get to in this car. That one's again quite wet, but still reasonable. Now with these spark plugs, I could clean them up and use them for many thousands of miles more, but equally they're not that expensive. So maybe perhaps the clever thing to do is actually to put in some brand new ones. But the key here is to make sure that I've got the right gap on the spark plug. And that's something that nowadays is probably less and less talked about but obviously when they come out of the factory they, are, they have given a gap but it's not necessarily the right gap for the car you're working with. In this particular vehicle it depends on what coil you're using as to how far the gap might be. The bigger the coil, usually or more powerful the coil, the bigger the gap can be because of course then you can get a bigger spark. But on this case really there's probably normally two sizes at least to choose from. You've got one and a half ohm coil and a three ohm coil. So what I'm going to do is just check what I've got in here at the moment. So I'm just setting my multimeter to effectively to resistance. And so I'm just now connecting these probes across the terminal. So 2.8, 2.7, 2.6. So it's about a three ohm coil, which means I can afford to up the gap a little bit. So on an engine of this size, we're looking for a gap on the spark plugs between 25 and 30 thousandth of an inch. So I'm gonna go for the 30 thou. So that's about, well, just over sort of seven and a half millimetres. So what I'm looking for when I'm actually checking the gap is I've got my feeder gauge and I'm just dragging it through that gap and I'm looking for a sort of like a light, a light drag. You can even hear it squeak, that's quite good. So I'll just do them all. So, so far, they're actually pretty good out of the box. So that one is slightly, I'd say that was slightly more loose. So what I can do is I can just sort of on a hard surface, I just Got to be a bit careful because you can easily close them up. I have to start all over again. I mean, just a tiny bit more. So now all of our four spark plugs are gapped correctly. I can now pop them back into the engine.
So now the spark plugs are done, I want to check the distributor cap, make sure that's okay, and also the rotor arm. So, actually the cap is looking quite reasonable, it's not too bad at all, I think what I can do, I'll give it a bit of a clean. So now just looking at the rotor arm itself, there's a little bit of build up of, not stabilisation, but actually now, it should be good. The cap's back on, that's okay, just as hard to get to is the oil dipstick if i can just reach in oh look at that that's pretty much bang on just under maximum so that's fine so now the oil's okay the last thing to check is just the water make sure we've got some of that and that's nice and easy to get to from here so just open that lovely so we have oil we have water we now have hopefully a much better working ignition system we've got rid of the fuel leak going to our carburetor so theoretically we're nearly ready to go for a test drive. The only thing I've got to do yet is pump up a tyre. I can do that. Now the Classic Mini was obviously renowned for its wonderful handling and that was mostly down to its tiny size. So it had a wheelbase of about two metres or 80 inches. But this is Mini base, but they've actually taken the rear and front subframes and squished them together even tighter. So they've actually now got a wheelbase of 1.2 metres or about 48 inches. And interestingly, the track of a Mini is also 48 inches. So the wheels sit in a kind of a square, which you sort of make sense when you think it's at the bottom of a sphere, but it means that the handling's even more lively and even more fun. Now, we've got a flat tyre over here, so it's a slow puncture, set my pressure, go for about 30 I suppose, set it going. Now another interesting quirk on this vehicle, it's mini base in a classic mini, the battery is based in the boot, but as you kind of walk through the boot, they had to put it just here on the side, but it's covered by a nice little bit of upholstery. Now, one of the features I really love about this car is it comes with its own workbench. I mean, how handy is that? Particularly when you break down on the side of the road and it's raining. So at least you can do all your work on the engine bay in relative comfort. Now, there are loads of features in here to remind you that you're driving a classic Mini. You've got that wonderful speeder there in the centre. You've got the dials, the switches, the choke, even the handbrake all comes straight out of the Mini. In fact, even this little air vent is also normally found in the dashboard of a Mini. It's not very effective. In fact, it's probably even less effective here than it is in a standard car. You have got some slots on the top of the dash here to try and clean the screen on a cold November morning. They kind of nearly work once you've got the engine up to temperature. Now you may also notice there's a gear selector bolted to the floor. When I first got the vehicle, it was actually positioned in its original place up here on this platform by the seat. Now, first of all, it was quite awkward when it was rubbing up against your knee as you're driving along. But worse than that, there was a custom made control cable that went from that selector all the way down to where the gearbox connector is underneath the engine. And of course, because it was going through so many bends, it perished quite quickly, it failed. And in fact, to get us down from the London to Brighton, we had to borrow this just to get us out of trouble. And of course, it's remained there ever since. So I will attend to that sometime in the future. Now, perhaps the weirdest thing about this vehicle is its driving position. As you can see in that pedal box, there really isn't very much room for two legs unless you're really, really tiny. So for me, I have to drive it with one leg up and one leg down, which is actually quite comfortable as it turns out. So once you've got your leg right in there and the seat right back, it's quite casual, it's quite relaxed, but it is okay. It's not too uncomfortable. And in a place where there already isn't enough room, they've actually added a little trap door where you can see a brake reservoir. Now, even though the seating position is a little bit unconventional, one lovely thing about this is the massive amount of headroom, particularly for special occasions, because you've got room for a top hat. Even a stovepipe would fit in here. Wonderful. It's a dreadful noise. I'm quite glad actually, driving with the back door open. It's all right, it's quite nice, get some air going on. Oh, that noise is getting worse. I have a funny feeling something might explode any second, but anyway, we'll see how we get on. Now the first thing, there's definitely no strange smell of Petra anymore, which is great, so at least I've fixed that problem. And actually, she's running quite nicely. Obviously, it's rather hard to ignore that rather horrible noise. It's a shocking noise, in fact. 
basically it's a bearing giving up and I think it's either coming from the alternator which is not so hard to fix or it might be coming from the water pump which is obviously a slightly bigger job on one of these particularly with that lack of space so I'll have to have a look at those later also it's kind of a bit stuttery it's sort of not really getting up and going and I noticed earlier on actually while I was playing around with the spark leads that there's a vacuum hose missing off the distributor. I wasn't sure whether somebody had been fiddling and kind of come up with their proper setting, but also it was blanked off just by the carburetor. And I think it might be the fact that because we haven't got the vacuum connected to the carburetor, we no longer have the vacuum advance, which is perhaps why it's bogging down a little bit. So basically I'm now trying to give it a bit of acceleration, a bit of beans, not much is going on. So that's another job for the list. fit right in, a bit of orange fruity craziness, <laughs> but it's just bags of fun, it really is, you can kind of dart backwards and forwards, I mean it's so responsive, it's wonderful, I don't think it would take much to get a couple of wheels off the ground, but then of course you'd end up potentially rolling it and that wouldn't be quite so much fun. Now another thing that's a bit weird about this is of course the steering is fantastically responsive, really 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 good fun. But the only thing is, it kind of pulls to the right. So if I actually let go of the steering, like that, it just literally <laughs> goes straight into the middle of a field, which is obviously not ideal. Now the thing is, I know it's not the tyre pressures, they're all okay. So then it means it's probably something to do with the steering or the geometry of the suspension. Now the steering is adjustable because you can move the track rod ends, but the rest of the suspension is pretty much fixed at the factory. So it could be quite a difficult thing to solve. Either way, I've got lots more work to do in the workshop and I think I deserve a cup of tea and perhaps this is a job for another day. I've just got time to squeeze in a couple of questions. So the first one is from Sick Transit Glory or actually Lindsay. Any tips for getting pattern panels to fit it? I've got wings and inner arches to fit to my old transit. Well, it's a good question, Lindsay. Really, when it comes to pattern panels, you get what you pay for. The cheaper panels are cheap, usually because the tooling is a bit worn, and often that means the panels aren't gonna fit quite as well as the better quality ones. So always go for the best quality ones that you can afford. Now, when it comes to actually using those panels, don't feel obliged to use all of the panel that you buy. So if you imagine you've got your repair that you need to make here, cut out all of the rotten metal, all of that rust. And once you've got your kind of ideal hole, if you like, then use that as an idea of the bit that you want to remove from the pattern panel, and then save the rest for another day when you might need a few bits of metal for some other patches. But that way, you minimize the amount of work that you have to do on your panel, but also you maximize the amount of your original car that you get to retain. So that's got to be a win-win. Now, when it comes to cutting the metal, you can go old school with some shears but it's probably worth going for the set where you get a straight a left and a right and of course that just helps you cut round corners which is very very useful now if you've got a compressor you could always have a go with an air saw and with the right blade you can get into some really tight little corners and get some nice bits of detail there and of course if you want to go really sporty you could always go with a plasma cutter now what I probably use the most is just an angle grinder with a cutting disc. And if you use a standard three mil steel cutting disc, the thing is, because they're trying to remove so much material, they generally make a lot of heat and that can obviously damage the panel and just makes a lot of noise and a lot of mess. Now pretty much without fail, what I always use is a one mil cutting disc or stainless steel cutting disc. Now because they're so thin, the cuts you can make are really, really fine. It's a really nice detail, but do be careful because they do flex a little bit and if you catch them, they can explode. So make sure you're always wearing eye goggles, which of course you would be with everything when you're doing this sort of stuff. Now once you've actually done a bit of welding or even if you want to actually grind off a little bit more of the panels when you're trying to get them to fit, I tend to use a flap disc rather than a grinding disc. And as the name suggests, it's just basically lots of little flaps of sandpaper all stuck down on a wheel and they're really really effective at just cutting away lights bit of rust bit of paint but also right into the weld when you've got a nice bead to grind down and then to do a slightly lighter job of that you can also get these kind of hard abrasive sponges and they're great for removing again light rust and paint now a final thought when it comes to playing around with repair panels a really handy tip is to get yourself perhaps one of these little sort of magnetic trays so just pull off the magnet or perhaps even just buy yourself a magnet and then actually use that to hold your repair patch onto your bodywork, your original bodywork. And that way, of course, you'll have your hands free to do the welding. Now, I'm going to be getting very familiar with repair panels when I come around to tackle that ridiculously poor bodywork on the Range Rover. And talking of that, to answer the next question, I need to be in the engine bay. Now, we've had several comments on this particular subject, 
This one is from Music Is My Therapy. Great second video, surprised the oil wasn't checked and changed though. Well, that's a fair point, we should have really covered it. Now it's obviously ideal to try and change your oil once the oil is actually warm, but obviously when you're trying to start a car that's been standing around for this long, you want to first of all check it has oil, but then also before you really crank it over in anger, you want to make sure you're going to get good oil pressure. So on a petrol engine like this, it's quite easy. You could take off the king lead off the distributor to make sure you haven't got any sparks going on, and then you crank it over until the oil pressure light on the dash goes out then you could reconnect and then you're good to go now obviously you could try and hand crank it a little bit first but frankly on an engine this big I think that's going to be quite difficult you might never really get any good pressure but it might get some of the oil around the system first I guess you could also chuck it in gear and rub it down a hill but then of course you've had to check that the brakes work as well now on this particular engine there is actually quite a nice way of getting the oil pressure up before you start anything at all but for that I need to take the distributor out now the first thing I need to do to get the distributor out is to remove the tizzy cap. There's a clip on either side, so they're quite easy to remove. Looking at the state of these leads though, there may well be another job there because they're looking quite perished. I mean, I'll clean them up, but they may need to be replaced. Now, I'm just going to take that off and then just hold it in position, or out of the way at least. Cool. Now you can see the rotor arm there. Now obviously it's quite important that when I put the distributor back in again that it goes in exactly the right position, otherwise of course our timing will be out and it's not going to run anyway. But you can see here, rather than having to maybe mark it with a bit of tape or a pen, I can actually see that the rotor arm points straight at this bolt here on the manifold and that would be relatively easy to remember, so I'll be happy with that. Just to disconnect the wires too. Oh, there we go, right, that's cool. So now I'll just remove the vacuum pipe as well, which is also looking pretty perished. I might try here instead. And the problem is, of course, rubber does rather rot over time. So we may have some fun with that later. Now, the next thing I need to do is get to the bolt just down inside there. So basically, the distributor is sort of held into the engine by just a clamp that sort of clamps over like the shaft or the, sort of the shank of itself. And then it's actually held down by the bolt. So I'm just going to undo that and then get to this bolt. It's a little bit fiddly, but it's OK. Now the trick here would be to not drop this down into the engine. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to get it so the nut's most of the way off with any luck. Just get a little magnet on the stick. And I should then be able to just unwind that a little bit. We'll just take off, there we go. There we are. Do the same thing with the washer. Look at that, fantastic. And I'll just try, get the clamp up the same way. <laughs> but it's not having it. Oh no, there we go. We have one clamp as well. Fantastic. Now, now I've removed the clamp, of course the distributor is free to rotate and that's how you adjust the timing. So I've got to get it back in the right position, otherwise the timing will be out. Now I can do this visually as well. You can see the rotor arm, which is obviously, as we said earlier, pointing at the bolt. Also, we've got this kind of plastic cover there and, and you can see there's an edge of a bit of relief just where one of the bolts is and it's exactly in line with that. So as long as I get it in that back, in that same position, then the timing should be the same. So here we go, it's just... All right, there we go. So you can see you've got our little O-ring seal there. That's obviously stopping the oil from the engine coming back up. And then just further down, you've got this helical gear and then you can see that's what's actually driving the distributor around and on the end of that also being driven by that same right you can see is this little thing here and that's actually what drives the oil pump so my idea is to use one of these attached to a shaft i can put that into a drill i can then drive the oil pump directly spin it up and that's going to push oil around all the galleries around the engine and then eventually the oil pressure light is going to go off and i know the oil is in all the areas all those little nooks and crannies around the engine Right, so I've got myself an old second hand sort of bottom of the drive, if you like. So there's the gear and there's the oil. Oh, I've taken the pin out. Normally it takes a bit of going to get it out, but there we go. So that now is our oil pump drive. So I've also got myself a little bit of copper pipe there, drilled a hole in the end, so I can now just pop in a nut and bolt. So now when I twist my tube, we're going to be driving the pump around and it's got a little bit of flexibility in there as well. Now unfortunately at the moment, 
my little bit of copper pipe doesn't actually fit into the chuck of my drill, but I do have a solution. So I've got this like a, a hexagonal hole in there, of course, for crimping electrical connectors. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pop this in the, in like so, and then just going to gently operate it. What's going to be the jaws crush it. I'm just going to sort of tidy that up a little bit. And then we'll just go a little bit further along. Now, because the copper's a little bit thin, and I'm over pushing it a little bit, you can see you get this little sort of flange on the edge there, but that's okay because I can just crush that down. So now, hopefully, we should now have some joy. Look at that. Right, so. Let's pop that on there. So now what I need to do is just pop it into here. And one last thing I need to make sure is also have a little look and see where the oil drive is sitting at the moment. So right now, it's basically going kind of a longitudinally along the length of the van. And the reason I need to get that correct, of course, because it's going to be linked to the distributor. So when I put everything back in again, I want to make sure that it's all going to connect up. So I'm just spinning up the pump, and I imagine by now the oil light should have gone off. Just check that. Brilliant. So we now definitely have oil pressure, so now I put everything back together again and I know that at least the engine oil is primed and it's ready to be started. Now one last thing I've got to do, of course, before I leave this or start to put it back together again, is I've got to make sure that our little drive at the bottom there is in the right orientation. So it was going front to back or axially, and so now I'll just do... Right, so that is now going basically the same line as the car. So we're in good shape, ready to put everything back together again. So that was a great question, thank you very much. Now. Obviously, this Range Rover is fighting me a little bit, and of course, the jobs are rather expanding from when I first took it on, but it's okay, because that's partly where the fun is, but also, my mate John is one of those guys who can never do enough for you, and frankly, he's helping me out on the electric ice cream van project with all the refrigeration work, and talking of that, here's the next instalment. With the diesel engine gone and being replaced with an electric motor, the flywheel is only needed to support the clutch mechanism, as there's no engine vibration to smooth out. With no need for the damping properties of a dual mass flywheel, I opted for a solid flywheel from an older model. But I still didn't need the extra weight, particularly on the outer part of the flywheel, so the excess steel is removed on the lathe. The holes are then counterboard and chamfered, ready for the starter or taper tap to cut a fine thread into each of the holes to match the original thread used on the flywheel box. Trial fitting a bolt, it seems that we need a bit more thread to be sure that the bolts tighten up on the flywheel rather than just hit the bottom of the holes. So Steve then uses a hand bottoming tap to cut the threads right to the bottom of the blind holes. Steve places in the centering ring, then we trial fit the flywheel using some longer bolts which will accommodate an extra spacer. The adapter is then turned over, ready to drill the holes for the motor shaft in the smaller end. See it? See the spot on or the clock's broken? <laughs> A centre drill is used to start the holes, followed by the tapping drill. And then the counterbore. And finally, a countersink drill to give the holes a chamfer. Pretty much the same procedure as for the flywheel end, this time with smaller holes for the smaller bolts. Then the milling machine is used to wind a taper tap in and out to get the thread started.
I then use a hand bottoming tap to finish them off. Finally, Steve adds a small chamfer to each freshly drilled hole in the motor shaft flange to ease assembly. Well, here is our turn down firewall and our shaft with the bearings as well. So now what I can do is connect the gearbox to the motor. Just try and get that into position. It's obviously a lot easier on the bench than it would be trying to do it in the engine bay. Right, there we go. So that's now in position. So now if I just slide this up, it should be in line now with my little bits of packing. Right, so now this is where they're going to sit in space, if you like. So what I need to do now is design a way of connecting this surface to this surface while keeping everything perfectly aligned. And for that, I'm going to need a couple of hours on my 3D design software, SolidWorks. <laughs> See you next week.